Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a bit of a privilege for me because I'm a bit of a Josh Burkus uh, fanboy. So, uh, uh, being being an old open office uh, a community guy, it's really good to see him here. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be really interesting, and you're going to love this to bits, ladies and gentlemen. Josh Burkus. Thank you very much. And um, just as a warning, I'm going to be demonstrating some stuff on the command line. So those of you who are all the way in the back of the auditorium might want to move up because there's a limit to how much I can shrink the text and still show you what I'm going to be showing you. So um, very exciting time in Postgres. This is a very, actually, this conference is coming at a very interesting time for talking about Postgres development um, because we are in the middle of our final commit fest uh, for Postgres 9.0, um, which started on January 15th. It started last week. And so this is uh, our final push for Postgres 9.0 development. So one of the first things that people ask me is, wait a minute, 9.0, I thought we were talking about 8.5. Because um, it was 8.4, now 8.5, right? So where did 9.0 come from? Well, we actually got in a bunch of stuff for 9 that we weren't sure was going to get in. Um, a lot of which actually makes a huge difference in who uses PostgreSQL. Um, both the hot standby and synchronous, not synchronous, whoops, change names there. Streaming replication, um, uh, which is their 64-bit windows, uh, executing ad hoc scripts in the command line, which is a do statement, uh, overhauled listen notified actually make it useful, plus a whole host of other features to the point where we sort of feel like we need to alert people that this is uh, a very different Postgres than what they dealt with with post the, the version in the 8 series. Um, uh, also to alert people that a lot of these new features are large enough that they may not work perfectly with the first release. So, Postgres 9. Um, and uh, it's going to be very exciting. It's going to, we're going to see Postgres used in a lot of different places. Uh, the other term that I threw out there that I think a lot of people are going to be confused by is commit fest, given that we invented the term. Does anybody here know what a commit fest is? Okay. We've got a few people in, involved in Postgres know what a commit fest is. Um, this is one of the things that we've been grappling with over the last several years with Postgres is how we develop PostgreSQL, the database, and how our annual sort of development cycle and that sort of thing works. Um, and we got into a real problem with uh, version, uh, particularly this, this came up, we got into a real problem with version 8.2, which dragged out six months behind schedule in terms of the release. And we said, well, we really, and it was, it was six months of really agonizing extra beta testing, which is not how anybody wants to spend their time. So we wanted to do something to fix that. And we realized that one of the biggest issues was the management of committer and reviewer time. Because where everything was bottlenecking was that we didn't have enough committers and enough reviewers reviewing enough stuff to actually get all of our stuff in. Every year we get more patches. And more patches means more review time. And we just really weren't scaling up. And this is, this is Tom Lane up here. Our, our alpha committer, um, uh, you know, and he does enjoy working with new contributors. That's um, Robert, ah, I used to work with him. Robert, anyway. He does enjoy working with new contributors um, and, uh, you know, and working with their stuff, but he'd rather be spending his time drinking wine with uh, Selena and Suzanne. Um, so when we say, okay, Tom, you've got to spend 70 hours a week reviewing people's code for the next three months, Tom kind of disappears on us. So uh, in order to fix this, um, we needed to have a new review process that allowed us to review patches faster, to review patches sooner, because one of our biggest problems was somebody would send in a patch, um, no review or integration would happen on it for four months, by the time anybody tested it, it no longer integrated with the current code tree, and we had to ask them for a new copy, and that didn't make anybody happy. 
Um, we need to, to make sure that we reviewed every patch because we had some issues with forgetting about people's stuff, and that really doesn't make anyone happy. Um, and most of all, we needed to scale up and train new reviewers. So what we came up with for that, um, and I'd actually rather show it to you live here, um, is the commit fest. And the idea of the commit fest, so this is, this is the current sort of commit fest. The idea of the commit fest is that every other month, um, and I'll show you the calendar, I, during the development period, which is about two-thirds of the year, every other month, people send everybody, all, we clear out the patch queue of all of the pen, pending patches. And everybody who's a reviewer or a committer spends all of their time clearing it out until they're done. Um, so, and the extra benefit this gives you is that if you're interested in Postgres and you're not yet contributing code to Postgres, you at least know what's going on in terms of what's getting reviewed and what's getting in and what's getting out, um, including doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, including, for example, which things are not getting accepted, uh, which could be fairly important to you if you really cared about a particular patch. Um, because then you know if it's early in the development period that maybe you need to pitch in and add some effort to that patch in the form of review or bug testing or documentation or whatever to make sure that it gets into the next version of Postgres. So this is how we're actually doing stuff now. This is an, an interface that we wrote ourselves, that actually Robert Haas wrote himself, um, where stuff gets submitted. It's still all driven by email. Um, but this is where you can know where patch is going on and post your reviews. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So, this is the development schedule that we went through for 8.5, which is now going to be 9.0. Um, and I, we have our four commit fests, which, you know, one, two, three, four, uh, which show you uh, what's going on. So we have a development period followed by commit fest, development period, commit fest. Um, then we need to do a little bit of cleanup, uh, take care of outstanding issues, and then go into beta testing and eventually release version 9.0 and start work on version 9.1, because, of course, we never actually stop on these things. Uh, so that's the new schedule and how things look. It's our effort to hold to a time-based release cycle, and we will see how well it works. And, of course, we need your help, because the more testing and the more effort you put in, the faster this whole cycle goes. So now... Um, the feature that everybody has been talking about in the Postgres community um, and the feature that has a lot of people excited who didn't use Postgres before is something called Hot Standby. Now, Hot Standby exists because of this guy, Simon Riggs. Um, and Simon Riggs looks kind of tired here. And he should be tired because I think he's actually been, for the last three years, the single largest feature contributor to Postgres. Um, for working on all kinds of big features. As a matter of fact, the whole effort to do hot standby, um, and I'll explain what that means historically, goes back several years to point-in-time recovery. Now, uh, the way that point-in-time recovery works is that Postgres has a binary transaction log that we use for crash recovery purposes. And several years ago, uh, 8.0 will be 2004, I believe, or 2000, 2003 or 2004. Several years ago, Simon realized that this binary log actually contained all of the information you needed to restore a Postgres server even at another location uh, with a couple of tweaks. And so the way that we designed point-in-time recovery work, the way that he designed it to work is first you take a snapshot copy, um, and you use some utilities of this, but it's a binary copy of the PostgreSQL server um, onto another machine. And then you accumulate copies of all of the transaction logs into a secure location, like a file server on the, on the network or whatever, um, for a while. And then something happens to the primary server. Um, and then you apply all those transaction logs to the secondary server and you bring it up. Um, and this was very good for people in the data warehousing realm for whom logical level backup 
that is, backing stuff up on the, the command line with a PG dump was took just way the heck too long. The problem is that if you're looking at it as a method of failover, it's much, much too slow. Restoring all those logs takes minutes to hours, depending on how many you've accumulated. So people were okay with this as a method of backup, but we needed something else for um, failover. So Simon's next effort was something called warm standby. Um, now, warm standby actually went through a couple of incarnations. We really considered it a feature of 8.3 because that was the first time that we had any administrative tools for it. You could have done it sort of ad hoc earlier. The idea of warm standby is, again, you're making a copy of the main server. Um, then you're writing copies of logs to a shared file location. But this time, you're applying the logs immediately after they're written. And that means that when the primary server dies, you can bring up the secondary server in a couple of seconds to, for a very large database installation, a couple of minutes. Much, much better for failover. However, people weren't completely satisfied uh, with warm standby because, well, the secondary server is in standby mode. That's another entire piece of expensive hardware. It's a database server. People would really like to be able to run at least read-only queries against the standby machine. But you can't because the standby machine is in recovery mode and it's not accepting connections from clients. So we wanted to fix that. Uh, but there were a lot of complicated pieces to fixing that. And those complicated pieces actually, again, jump back a couple of years uh, to this Chilean programmer, Alvaro Herrera, uh, who's reading up on the competition. And, um, sorry, Alvaro. Uh, and Alvaro uh, started working on this problem first. And one of the first things that he realized was that we had a problem with transactions. Because what the way that Postgres worked was everything you do with Postgres is transactional. It's 100% transactional. There's no non-transactional mode for Postgres. And what that meant was if you wrote some data to the database server, you would get back a transaction ID that would be associated with the write that you made. And if you read something from the server, you would also get back a transaction ID that was associated with the read that you made. And that way, we kept track of what was visible within what context. But there were a couple of problems with this. Number one, there was no way we were connecting to a read-only slave if we had to allocate transaction IDs to it, because those would conflict with the transaction IDs from the master server. The second problem with it is that people who had humongous read-only installations of Postgres, like whitepages.com, we're running out of transaction IDs because of all these read transactions. So uh, Alvaro went in there and he said, look, we don't really need a full transaction ID for the read transactions because they're not actually modifying any rows. Instead, we can just create what's called a ghost transaction ID, XID is transaction ID. And that ghost transaction ID just keeps track of where that read transaction is relative to write transactions that have completed. So that eliminated one obstacle, um, as well as making Postgres a little faster for certain use cases. So for hot standby, then in a two-year effort, uh, starting with, with the last version, Simon went through to implement the rest of the machinery required for hot standby uh, in order to be able to run read-only queries against the secondary server. Um, and actually, um, I think it'll be much more fun if I demonstrate this, so um, let's see what mode are we in here. Hold on. So part of standby is actually controlled. So your Postgres standby and replication is actually controlled with a new configuration file. This is just what you needed in Postgres, right? Another configuration file. However, that's the way it is. So um, I've actually already copied this over here. Oh, and you can't see this one anyway, so skip it. Not important. Um, so I've got this set up in, um, in, so you need to actually configure a couple of things. So the first thing that we're going, that we configured, sorry about the wraparound, um, is if you go to the write ahead log stuff, um, in your configuration file or you write it out yourself, um, the first thing that you need to do here, if you can see this, is that we're, we have to start doing what's called archiving. Um, and this is where you tell 
the primary server, I'm going to make copies of all of the log files. And this is an archive command. You just use common utilities like rsync and cp and that sort of thing. You don't need special tools for it. Um, and I've also actually set a timeout on that because I hot standby archives entire wall segments that are 16 megabytes. Um, and if you have a fairly low data stream, it might take you a while to generate 16 megabytes. So you can put a timer in there to actually generate them more quickly. So, and then the second thing that you actually have to set up is the new configuration file. Um, so I've got here, I've got, I'm doing this all in one machine because I couldn't work out how to do two machines with the video. Uh, So this is recovery.conf. Again, you know, there's one that we shipped that's got a whole bunch of notes. And the important thing for when you're doing hot standby is this restore command, um, which says what to do with the archive logs that you've received. Now, one of the things I recommend is there's a couple utilities out there. There's one that ships with Postgres called PG Standby. There's a second one that's released by Skype called Wall Manager. Um, I recommend using one of those rather than an ad hoc script. But if you have to, if, if you have your own sysadmin infrastructure, you may actually want to use your own sort of scripts and controllers. Um, and that's pretty much what's required for hot standby between two servers. Everything else that's required is actually already set up by default, um, except that, of course, we have to bring the server up. So the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to um, start the primary server. So we start the primary server. For those of you who've done warm standby, this is the same method you use for warm standby. But I presume most, how many people here have actually used Postgres warm standby? Yeah, so a couple of people. So for most of you, this is new, right? So you connect as the database super user. Um, and then we're going to start a backup. Now, what, what I'm doing here is I'm telling Postgres I'm going to take a binary snapshot of the database. So you need to save all of the versions of stuff necessary to complete the binary snapshot without corrupting the database. If you don't do this start backup thing, then you do a binary copy of the database, and some files get copied later than others, and you end up with a corrupt database you can't use. Um, this takes care of that. So now we are going to go ahead and copy that database. And let me get, I don't want to retype the rsync command, so let me get out of my history here. So I just using rsync, um, so it's not, uh, no real sort of special commands are required. And then having done the copy, um, I will stop the snapshotting so that vacuum and stuff will uh, clean up rows again. Um, and then uh, once I've done that, I should be able to bring up the slave server. Um, Okay, now, this is, um, apparently our correction didn't actually uh, work. We, we were actually hacking on this this afternoon. These error messages are actually bogus. Um, and I, and uh, Celine and I were trying to remove them. Um, so, it'll get done. So you watch it progress here. It's looking for history files that are not in there and that we don't actually need. There we go. So now this is what's new is database system is ready to accept read-only connections because before with warm standby, you couldn't connect to the slave database at all. Um, so we will go ahead and connect to the slave database. Um, I have it running on. Um, so I've got a sample database that I had for an old uh, open source application. Um, so we are actually connected to the slave database here. Um, and we can do stuff in the slave database. So this is the master copy. Now, of course, in the slave database, if we attempt to do things like um, so. oh, right. we will get to read only on the slave database. But on the primary database, we can actually do anything we want. Um, so, did you do, let's uh, 
query in here. Yeah. So, for example, these are a list of anonymized job candidates. So, and we can try the same on the slave. So that's what we've got. So now let's actually, we don't like one of the job candidates, so we're going to get rid of him. And let's see if I caught it in the right window. It was a little faster than I was. So one of the things that's happening here, I was, I was trying to actually catch it within the 30-second window, um, uh, but I wasn't quite fast enough. So one of the things with hot standby is that um, you are archiving log files. So whatever your log timeout is, or when you hit that 16 megabyte barrier, is when stuff actually gets copied over. Um, stuff doesn't get copied over before then. So it's a form of extremely asynchronous replication, um, which is actually more useful if you happen to be doing warm standby anyway and you just want to run a few read-only queries. <coughs> However, for people who really want this as replication, we have something else. So let me get out of both servers because I'm going to change modes and show you what else is going on. Okay. So... Now, one of the things I'm not actually going to demonstrate to you, but you should know about also because I'm talking a little bit about what's going on with development. So there's been some problems with hot standby, which is one of the reasons why it took two years. One of the problems is that hot standby is a form of binary replication. And the problem with binary replication is that you can have binary operations which occur on the master that are difficult to reproduce on the slave. For example, vacuum. Vacuum is Postgres's garbage collector that garbage collects dead rows from tables. And it does it in a binary fashion, rewriting individual disk pages. And the problem is that if the vacuum is allowed to go through the logs and perpetrate to the slave, when the vacuum hits the slave, you may have a query that was still looking at the rows that you just vacuumed away. And then that query ends with an error message, or worse yet, displays incorrect information and inconsistent information. So. The way that we actually fix that is with a setting called max standby delay. And what the standby delay says is, if something comes in which would conflict with a running query on, on the standby server, then stop applying the logs and accumulate logs for a short time until it clears out. However, once the timer runs out, then you go ahead you don't want to build up too many logs. You don't want to fill up your disk or let the slave get too far behind. So once the timer runs out, you go ahead and push through the vacuum and start applying logs. Now, if there was still a long-running query that goes beyond that time, then that query is going to get canceled with a fairly specific error message of your query has been canceled because of conflict. So it's something you have to keep in mind if you're using hot standby for, say, long-running reporting queries. Um, you may, against a very fast-moving OLTP database, you may need to do some playing around with the standby delay and that sort of thing in order to be able to complete the reporting queries on the slave. Now, I'm going to go into the other big feature which comes to us from NTT in Japan, uh, world's largest privately owned telecom, etc. They use Postgres for a bunch of different things inside NTT, and they have a different set of problems than what Simon was trying to solve with hot standby, which is... Their real concern, their number one concern, is zero data loss. They cannot lose a single row or single transaction ever because every single one of those transactions is money. Some of them involve contracts that guarantee people certain results. Um, also, uh, downtime measured in more than seconds is not acceptable. Um, single node performance has to be largely untouched, but... Unlike a lot of people looking for replication solutions, they're not so concerned with scalability via replication because they tend to vertically scale things. They have a lot of big iron 64 core machines they run Postgres on. So they're not concerned with horizontal scalability. So they were actually looking at solving 
our whole sort of replication Postgres data copy thing a different way. Um, two developers uh, from Japan, uh, Fuji Masao and Itagaki Takahiro, um, started working on this problem again two years ago, um, implementing something that they called synchronous log shipping replication because their real concern was no data loss. And they implemented this for some internal systems. They use it at NTT. They have it in operation there. But it involved a lot of sort of ad hoc code that was designed around how NTT used their databases and wasn't terrifically portable. So 18 months of work later, having overhauled it, we have a slightly different version of it that we now call streaming replication. Because the important thing about streaming replication is, again, we're replicating via the Postgres binary log. But we're, rather than replicating one 16 megabyte file at a time, we're replicating one transaction record from the log at a time. So something gets committed on the master, it gets committed on the slave very shortly after that. Uh, here's the basic way it works. First, again, like all the standby stuff, we make a copy of the master to the slave using the standby snapshot. Then we launch the slave, and the slave launches this process called wall receiver. I don't know what's going on with the text there. The slave launches this process called wall receiver, and wall receiver connects back to the master on the Postgres port. And the Postgres port answers with another thing called the wall sender, and the wall sender starts sending transaction records across one at a time. Now, optionally, you can also accumulate archive copies of your logs, which are useful because if the, if the secondary system falls far enough behind, it won't be able to catch up via connecting to wall sender. So having those copies of the logs can be useful, although you need to manage eventual deletion of them and that sort of thing. Sort of an issue. So. Um, let me go ahead and demonstrate that functionality. Um, so we need to shut everything down. If I didn't do it already. Yeah. So you can see a lot of the uh, a lot of the log shipping activity. But so if you obviously if you have your option, you always want to shut down the slave first. Um, And then shut down the master. And do, 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 do. I know you can't see this. All I'm doing is I'm copying a different recovery config file over. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Let's actually look at that again. So this is a different recovery file, and I've enabled some different options. So what this has with there is the log streaming replication parameters, which include standby mode and the connection information to the primary. Um, I've also given it some information about loading wall logs and that sort of thing. Uh, and um, given that, we should be able to bring the primary up again. And then we should be able to um, bring the slave up again. And if there are any logs available, it will automatically apply those logs until it runs out. Um, so it applied the logs that there were right up here. You can see it applied some logs because they were available, and then it ran out of logs. And so once it ran out of logs, it launches a connection to the master and starts asking for transactions directly. And so again, we can reconnect to the database, reconnect to the slave database right here. Now, one of the nice things about this, for those of you who've used logical level or application on Postgres, is that there isn't any limit to what you can do. Um, for example, dropping a database or adding a database with logical level replication, things like Sloney and Bucardo and um, and Lundeast with Postgres uh, was a painful process that involved running some external scripts. The nice thing, oh, oops, who am I connected as here? Uh, right. Is that I can drop the database 
and the database is dropped from the slave right away without needing any sort of special functionality. So if you're managing a group of developers, binary replication is really going to help you because you don't have to tell them, oh, you can't run this SQL or DDL stuff. Um, most importantly, compared to a lot of the logical level, level replication tools, it's going to be a little clunky administrative in version 9.0, but it is a lot easier to get set up and get running um, than previous replication solutions that we had and has the effect of being able to also be used for standby and failover. So, since I've actually managed to stick to my schedule, um, I want to talk about one other feature, um, because this one's a little bit smaller feature and a little easier to get your hands on. It didn't take two years to develop. And this feature was actually developed by two people. Robert Haas, who's one of our newest committers, um, who's also been running the commit fest and been contributing a whole ton of stuff lately. Um, and Greg Savino Mulane, who's been a contributor to Postgres probably as long as I have, um, and maintains the Perl drivers. So one of the things that um, Robert Haas in noticed initially, and let's get to the master here. Um, is uh, now we have this tool for monitoring queries called Explain Analyze, and Explain Analyze um, and Explain Analyze is very nice in terms of getting a sort of readable version of how the query executed, what the Explain plan was, and how it actually executed, and that sort of thing. And all of us use it for interactive debugging of queries. The problem is that while this format is reasonably readable for a human being, it's very difficult for an external program to parse. And as a result, even the administrative tools that support Postgres tend not to have anything to actually analyze query execution. So. Robert said, hey, that should be easy enough to solve. We just need to supply some alternate explain formats. Um, and that's what he did. Um, and you use this new syntax. So we can get... Okay, well, I'm having some horrible wraparound issues. Sorry about that. Um, uh, it'll look a little bit neater on your terminal. Um, but, you know, we can get, say, the whole explain plan in XML form. Now, I'm personally not a big fan of XML, um, I, and uh, neither was Robert, as far as I know. So um, we've also supplied JSON format, which is a little bit more compact um, and useful, a lot more useful to the languages I tend to program in. Um, so you can go ahead and design your own tools to look at explain plans using JSON. Now, having done JSON and XML, Greg said, hey, JSON and XML are nice, but I'm a Perl geek. I really want to use YAML. And besides which, YAML is more readable for humans. So he wrote up a patch um, to do it in YAML. And initially, people were going, YAML, oh, we don't need another format. That's not a standard format and that sort of thing. But once he actually showed us the patch, so here's the YAML patch, it was so short that we said, oh, what the heck, let's accept it anyway. After, of course, a suitable amount of argument on the mailing lists from people who'd never heard of YAML before. Um, so that's Greg's entire patch, and it actually gives you an idea of what's required for some of the stuff. And by the way, for those of you thinking about contributing to Postgres, um, we generally require that our contributors submit documentation with their patches because that's how we've maintained the quality of documentation that we have. So you will often get something rejected if it doesn't include documentation, and that's why you'll see that in the patch. So um, he went ahead and did it in, went ahead and submitted YAML. It was accepted just in the last commit fest. Um, and uh, we have YAML formatted, which is actually a little bit more human readable. So actually, I've been using this instead of the standard explain format when debugging queries, um, at least testing an 8.5, because it's actually a little bit easier to see what's going on 
in terms of, for example, estimated cost versus uh, execution time. Um, and we really invite anybody who's into writing GUI tools, uh, analysis tools and stuff to make use of this to write your own tools for analyzing queries. So um, a few other things in the time that we have. So now you notice that we had a lot of contributors from a variety of countries, Americans, Japanese, UK, uh, a Chilean. I, as far as I know, there is only one code contributor to Postgres from New Zealand, which is Mark Kirkwood. Now, you have quite a tech industry here, and there's a lot of people using Postgres. So it would be really good to actually get some more contributors from New Zealand, because we need more contributors. One of the biggest things that we need is review and testing. Particularly, we're about to go. The Commit Fest will be over in two and a half weeks. Um, and then we'll release an alpha. Um, and then later on, and after we clean out some outstanding issues of beta, and how long our testing period is depends entirely on how many people we get to do good testing. So that's the first thing that we need is we really need, if you use Postgres, if you like Postgres, we really need you to get in and start doing some testing on version 9.0 because the more testing you do and the sooner you do it, the faster we can release it. Um, particularly, people porting and testing their production applications in a suitable test environment, of course, um, on the new version will tell us a lot about whether or not we broke something. Um, the other thing is, you know, and the reason that the other reason that you should contribute is that we are a nonprofit open community. So if you contribute to Postgres, you are an equal member of the community along with people who've been uh, contributing for years or people who work for Enterprise DB or uh, Red Hat or other companies. Um, and that's how you get involved in Postgres and how you make Postgres happen. If you happen to be interested in databases and interested in tinkering with databases, um, I, Postgres is one of your best places to do it because we have such an open architecture and we have so many database geeks already in the project. So if you get interested in contributing to Postgres, uh, hackers mailing list, testers mailing list, I've got, you can look at these in the slides later, uh, specific features list, actually, um, what would be, how about if I show these to you instead? Oh, here's another important thing going on with Postgres development today. Um, we're moving from CVS to Git. Um, so um, we did this version sort of dual, some people contributing through CVS and some people contributing through Git. If we can convince a couple of people to stop dragging their feet, um, yeah, hopefully um, we will be getting rid of CVS probably for the next development cycle. Um, I, we don't quite have consensus on that yet, but Git has been working fairly well for us, particularly for these really long-running changes um, to Postgres uh, that required people creating their own branches um, for testing and that sort of thing. Uh, other stuff, um, oh, user groups. Um, we have a bit of a formatting problem here. Um, we do technically have user groups in Wellington, Adelaide, Canberra, and Sydney. Um, as far as you know, all of those have been kind of intermittent on when they're having meetings. But get through the pug site and contact whoever's listed as the organizer for those and bug them about having a meeting or better yet, uh, organize a meeting yourself. Um, here's our wiki. A lot of people don't seem to know about this. This is where we do have most of our in-development documentation and how things are working and and finding out about new features in development, um, as well as a whole bunch of other information. Um, we have a Doxygen site for getting into the code. Um, for example, uh, Selena and I were just messing with PG Standby earlier today, and this is the dependency graph for PG Standby, um, uh, in terms of trying to figure out why its error reporting was broken. Um, and, um, and of course, official documentation um, and a whole bunch of other information. So I want to have time for questions. I don't think there was anything else really important. So we will just put up the information slide, and I will have a few minutes for questions. So questions.
Hi, Josh. Um, how would you compare the the streaming replication with uh, something like the RBD? Hmm. Um, it's similar conceptually because DRBD is binary replication at the file system level. And you can actually use DRBD with Postgres. Um, your issue with uh, DRBD is that you're not going to get any kind of scalability against the backend database because you can use DRBD for Postgres. It works great for failover, but you can't really load balance the reads with it. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, if you don't need to load balance the reads, it can be a much simpler solution administratively. Hmm? No, because you're not replicating everything. You're just replicating the transaction logs. So it would be a lot less network traffic. I mean, I haven't actually measured, but... That, that should be the way it works. Um, two quick questions, please. Do you have any news on the collation front? Um, are we going to get more collation options? Um, nobody's been working on that this year. That's been a big to-do forever. I mean, obviously what we want is per column or per field collations. Um, and there's a major amount of work that needs to be done to make that happen. And as far as I know right now, nobody's doing that. So uh, if, if you have a strong interest in it and either have C skills or money um, <laughs> or both, we would really welcome that. That's been a, on our to-do list for like a decade. Um, the other question I had was uh, looking at your slides on the streaming uh, replication. There was a heartbeat and whatnot in there. So. Yeah, and so that was part of what we removed oh, because okay. it was very sort of organized around NTT's own infrastructure. Mm. And our thought was it's much better. I mean, the thing is that when you deal with replication failover situations, there are any number of different events that could happen. And we felt that the existing administrative tools within the open source sphere, I uh, you know, so various from administrative frameworks like Tivoli down to um, things just like Linux Heartbeat um, and other stuff that the external tools that existed were managerially much more sophisticated than anything we could have built in. And so the idea is for dealing with the actual failover process, that is when to bring the slave up, when to shoot the primary node in the head and that sort of thing, much better done through external tools that the sysadmins already understand. So there are no plans for a witness server or anything like that? No. No, the, the only plans is, and probably won't happen in 9.0, is to add some monitoring hooks so that, for example, the slave server can tell you when it stopped receiving stuff or when it's not keeping up. Um, and that was actually in the list of things that, that it doesn't look like we're going to get completed for 9.0 and will end up in 9.1. But beyond that, what action you actually take on that is really much better handled outside the database. Um, so the log shipping and log moving is great. If I've got clustered file systems or block level replicating SANs, can I utilize that with the code that's going to the standard code space? Is there any provision to allow the external to take, the external file system to take care of that data replication? Um, yeah, so there's, so there's a number of ways that you can integrate that. First of all, let me say that if you're using table spaces in the logical level of Postgres, that, Im, that adds some complexity to the binary copying process that I'd really recommend not attempting lightly. If you're not using table spaces because you have a clustered file system that makes it look like one big file system to Postgres regardless of how it's actually implemented, that makes things a lot easier um, because then we don't pay attention to that. We just ship pages. So the first thing you would do is when you do the PG stop backup, I used rsync to do the initial snapshot. But I don't have to use rsync. I could use, if I have a snapshotting file system, I can use a file system snapshot to do the initial duplication. Um, for that matter, if you have file system snapshotting, um, well, that would be a little bit complicated. Um, the, um, so, so you can do it for, for, to do the initial snapshot and then beyond that 
it becomes just a matter of shipping over the logs. There are probably ways that you could use a clustered file system to make the shipping log, the actual physical copying of the logs more efficient for when you're doing hot standby or warm standby. Um, as far as streaming is concerned, that's a network connection. Um, so it's really not going to be affected by the file system one way or the other. Okay. Uh, with your code reviews, do you use any particular tools for that? No. The reviews themselves still happen manually according to whatever tools people use. Um, we looked at Review Board, for example, when we were first doing the Commit Fest stuff. But Review Board very much focuses on, on the actual process of reviewing the individual lines of code itself and not what our primary problem was, which is reviewing this huge mass of patches. I mean, for an individual version of Postgres, an individual release of Postgres lately tends to get between 350 and 500 patches submitted. So our issue was managing the patches that were being submitted and what their status was, not so much the review itself, which we felt that people were capable of handling on their own. Um, if we could somehow integrate what we have in terms of management with something like Review Board, it would be really nice. But when we looked at just extending Review Board to support what we needed, it looked like more work than just throwing something up. Yes. Uh, I had a question about multiple standby machines and uh, how you deal with developing a standby when your primary has fallen over dead. Okay. Um, so with, um, first of all, the both hot standby and streaming replications support having multiple standby machines. Um, since hot standby is just shipping physical logs, there's, it really makes no difference to the master whether you're shipping them to multiple locations or just one location, as long as you have a utility to handle that. Um, if you're doing streaming, there is, um, and also because it's still entirely asynchronous, uh, by the way, the plan from the NTT folks is to implement a synchronous option for 9.1, um, at which point how many synchronous slaves you have would have a very strong effect on the master. Um, but since it's asynchronous now, there isn't really a strong effect on the master whether you have one slave or multiple slaves because any conflicts are handled by, by making errors on the slave rather than by bogging down the master. Um, the... Um, so that, that was your question, multiple slaves. In terms of slave promotion, um, what both hot standby and streaming support is a concept of a trigger file um, where, uh, and you see those in the options, and I didn't really go into it, where you can have either a file or a command um, that gets run um, that, first of all, the file triggers the presence. If, if you basically write this file, it says stop replication now and become a regular a master server, um, and the um, and you can even run a command at that time. The draw um, in terms of slave promotion, in terms of secondary promotion to being a new master for a group, um, that could theoretically work if all of the secondaries are 100% in sync. If any of them are lagging behind for whatever reason. Um, then it, it wouldn't work. So um, that's actually an area that needs more work because right now if, if, if you need to be absolutely safe and bulletproof, when you promote a secondary, you actually have to re-snapshot it um, over the other secondaries in order to make it the new master because otherwise if one of the secondaries is in a different, isn't caught up with the other secondaries, it won't accept the new secondary as its master. Um, and plus, you know, at this point, changing the files about which server to connect to and everything is entirely manual. These are all things that need to be done. All the administrative stuff that's not going to be 9.0, that's part of it. I'm, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be yep. the time Nazi. Okay. <laughs> yep. So further questions in the hall? Yeah. In the foyer? In the, the foyer? Yeah. That'll be great. Oh, thank pay, you. Pay, pay day, thank you very gosh. much. <laughs> I, I love this New Zealand wine. I really wish, <laughs> I really wish I could get more of this in San Francisco. I can, I can. So thank you. I can tell you a shop. <laughs> yeah.